In the hospital yard there stands a small lodge surrounded by a perfect forest of burdocks, nettles and wild hemp. Its roof is rusty, the chimney is tumbling down, steps at the front door are rotting away and overgrown with grass. There are only traces left of the stucco. The front of the lodge faces the hospital. At the back it looks out into the open country from which it is separated by the grey hospital fence with nails on it. These nails, with their points upwards, and the fence, and the lodge itself, have that peculiar, desolate, God-forsaken look which is only found in our hospital and prison buildings. If you're not afraid of being stung by the nettles, come by the narrow footpath that leads to the lodge and let us see what's going on inside. Opening the first door, we walk into the entry. Here, along the walls and by the stove, every sort of hospital rubbish lies littered about. Mattresses, old tattered dressing gowns, trousers, blue stripped shirts, boots and shoes no good for anything. All these remnants are piled up in heaps, mixed up and crumpled, moldering and giving out a sicky smell. The porter, Nikita, an old soldier wearing rusty, good conduct stripes, is always lying on the litter with a pipe between his teeth. He has a grim, surly, battered-looking face of a hanging eyebrows which give him the expression of a sheepdog over the steps and the red nose. He is short and looks thin and scraggy, but he is of imposing deportment and his fists are vigorous. He belongs to the class of simple-hearted, practical and dull-witted people prompt in carrying out orders, who like discipline better than anything in the world, so are convinced that it is their duty to beat people. He showers blows on the face, on the chest, on the back, on whatever comes first, and is convinced that there would be no order in the place if he did not. Next, you come into a big, spacious room, which fills up a whole lodge except for the entry. Here the walls are painted dirty blue. The ceiling is as sooty as in a hut without a chimney. It is evident that in the winter the stove smokes and the room is full of fumes. The windows are disfigured by iron gratings on the inside. The wooden floor is grey and full of splinters. There is a stench of sore cabbage of smoldering wicks, of bugs, and of ammonia, and for the first minute this stench gives you the impression of having walked into a menagerie. There are bedsteads screwed to the floor, men in blue hospital dressing gowns and bearing night caps in the old style, sitting and lying on them. These are the lunatics. There are five of them in old hair. Only one is of the upper class, the rest are all artisans. The one nearest the door, a tall, lean workman with shining red whiskers and tear-stained eyes, sits with his head propped on his hand, staring at the same point. Day and night he grieves, shaking his head, sighing and smiling bitterly. He takes a part in conversation and usually makes no answer to questions. He eats and drinks mechanically when food is offered him. From his agonizing throbbing cough, his thinness, and the flush on his cheeks, one may judge that he is in the first stage of consumption. Next to him is a little, alert, very lively old man, with a pointed beard and curly black hair like negroes. By day he walks up and down the ward from window to window, or sits on his bed, cross-legged like a Turk, and ceaselessly, as a bullfinch whistles, softly sings and titters. He shows his childish gaiety and lively character at night also when he gets up to say his prayers, that is, to beat himself on the chest with his fists and to scratch with his fingers at the door. This is the Jew, Maiseka, an imbecile who went crazy twenty years ago when his head factory was burned down. And of all the inhabitants of Ward Number 6, He's the only one who is allowed to go out of the lodge and even out of the yard into the street. He has enjoyed this privilege for years, probably because he is an old inhabitant of the hospital, quiet, harmless imbecile, the buffoon of the town where people are used to seeing him surrounded by boys and dogs. 
in his wretched gown and his absurd nightcap, and in slippers, sometimes with bare legs and even without trousers, he walks about the streets, stopping at the gates and little shops, and begging for copper. In one place they will give him some kwas, in another some bread, in another copper, so that he generally goes back to the world feeling rich and well-fed. Everything that he brings back, Nikita takes from him for his own benefit. The soldier does this roughly, angrily turning the Jews' pockets inside out and calling God to witness that he will not let him go into the street again, and that breach of the regulations is worse to him than anything in the world. Maiseka likes to make himself useful. He gives his companions water, covers them up when they are asleep. He promises each of them to bring him back a kopeck and to make him a new cap. He feeds with a spoon his neighbor on the left who is paralyzed. He acts in this way, not from compassion nor from any considerations of a humane kind, but through imitation, unconsciously dominated by Gromov, his neighbor on the right hand. Ivan Gromov, man of thirty-three, who is a gentleman by birth, and has been a court usher and provincial secretary, suffers from the mania of persecution. He either lies curled up in bed or walks from corner to corner as though for exercise. He very rarely sits down. He is always excited, agitated, and overrode by a sort of vague, undefined expectation. The faintest rustle in the entry or shout in the yard is enough to make him raise his head and begin listening, whether they are coming for him, whether they are looking for him, and at such times his face expresses the utmost uneasiness and repulsion. I like his broad face with its high cheekbones, always pale and unhappy, and reflecting as though in a mirror, a soul tormented by conflict and long continued terror. His grimaces are strange and abnormal, but the decline lines traced on his face by profound, genuine suffering show intelligence and sense, and there is a warm and healthy light in his eyes. I like the man himself, courteous, anxious to be of use, and extraordinarily gentle to everyone except Nikita. When anyone drops a button or a spoon, he jumps up from his bed quickly and picks it up, Every day he says good morning to his companions, and when he goes to bed he wishes them good night. Besides his continually overbroad condition and his grimaces, his madness shows itself in the following way also. Sometimes in the evenings he wraps himself in his dressing gown and, trembling all over with his teeth chattering, begins walking rapidly from corner to corner and between the bedsteads. It seems as though he is in a violent fever. From the way he suddenly stops and glances at his companions, it can be seen that he is uh, longing to say something very important, but apparently reflecting that they would not listen or would not understand him, he shakes his head impatiently and goes on pacing up and down. But soon the desire to speak gets the upper hand of every consideration, and he will let himself go and speak fervently and passionately. His talk is disordered and feverish like delirium disconnected and not always intelligible, but on the other hand something extremely fine may be felt in it, both in the words and the voice. When he talks you recognize in him the lunatic and the man. It is difficult to reproduce on paper his insane talk. He speaks of the baseness of mankind, of violence trampling on justice, of the glorious life which will one day be upon earth, of the window gratings which remind him every minute of the stupidity and cruelty of oppressors. It makes a disorderly, incoherent potpourri of themes old but not yet out of date.